Thanks for uh, coming out this evening. Yes? No? Nothing more? Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, welcome to the Ripple Effect, uh, where we talk about the combination of horticulture and aquaculture. It's not loud enough. Not loud enough? I'll get a little. Tell me to the speakers in just a moment. Okay. Uh, again, my name is Jeremy, Grounds and Research Supervisor at Juniper Level Botanic Garden. And my name is Megan Fiddler. I'm the uh, nursery manager at Plant Delights Nursery at the Juniper Level Botanic Garden. Today, Jeremy and I are going to be talking about how we actually created a pond and the marriage between horticulture and aquaculture. His emphasis is going to be primarily on looking at the way machines can operate in space and the actual planning of that space so that you can get every element you need to have it function adequately. And as you'll see, I will stray away from the normal horticultural uh, monologue and talk a little bit more about cultural meanings. So why did we build pond? Over the years, I've, uh, well, I've noticed that most big gardens or, or high-end gardens have some sort of a pond or a water feature. But honestly, I, I've literally spent almost a year of my life in a boat fishing. So uh, it would only make sense to, to, to incorporate a water feature just large enough that I could actually float my boat on it. Um, but um, yeah, so, that, that, and I want a crappie. I had to have a crappie. I wanted a crappie where I live. That's always been a goal of mine, even as a little kid, to bring a crappie home and let it swim around. <laughs> and I wanted a pond because when I was studying overseas, every time you learn a foreign language, they make you take a cultural class. And a lot of times if you're in Japan and a girl, they want you to learn how to put on a kimono, they want you to learn ikebana or flower arrangement, or they want you to do things like that. I wanted to learn kendo, which is the art of hitting people with a stick. Um, but we ended up getting a balance in that because I was studying um, gardens and people, I ended up working at a number of gardens and being a partial caretaker for many of the emperor's koi and then some of the koi in the master of the nets garden in China. Yeah, and as the Bristol Briar matures, uh, Bristol Briar, Briar being our, our home garden, uh, we're, we're doing more and more to organize the plantings uh, for watering needs. So. Uh, Xeric plants, your, your succulents, agaves, things like that, or we're, we're trying to put them more in one area where we don't have to worry about watering them so much. Uh, and then plants that need a lot of water, well, a pond, at least the way that uh, I had envisioned building it, would be a perfect opportunity to um, make a space for plants that needed wet sun. And uh, that's what we began to work towards. Uh, so from inception to pool. Seven years of thinking about it. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> ah, 2011, that's uh, when I purchased what was to become the Bristol Briar. Uh, but even then I was already thinking about the shape of the pond and the surrounding beds and a thousand different ways of laying it out going through my head. I already knew that the, uh, I was gonna put the, uh, a plate for, there it is. I wanted to pond all the way back there in the corner. That just made the most sense. It was a further spot downhill in the, in the property. Um, I just thought it would look good. So, but in the meantime, what to do with all that space? Uh, you know, there's languishing fruit trees, there's misplaced red maples, there's a ligustrum sinense hedge. Uh, it's par for the neighborhood. I love my neighbors, but they had no idea what was coming. <laughs> so, back in 2012, my first uh, horticultural incantation was cucurbita maxima. And uh, <laughs> the first thing we, we did was threw some pumpkins in there. I threw pumpkins for a few years. Um, what, you know? Some people carve pumpkins, but what's really the best thing to do with a bunch of 200 pound pumpkins? Uh, well, here's a hint. <laughs> There's a the pond right there. I'm actually standing in it. Uh, so we were, you know, it, yeah, and I just. It must have been a bad day at work. It must have been a tough day at work. Uh huh, yeah, a pretty tough day at work. <laughs> Wait a minute, who's that guy? Who's that guy? <laughs> 
think uh, Zachary Hill must have had a tough day at work as well. <laughs> so, let it all out. It's good. I didn't. <laughs> There's oh, yeah. <laughs> Four wheel drive wish fulfillment there. I've always wanted to do that too. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> pumpkins were an effective way to fill a big backyard and provided simple pleasures while uh, reconstructing the pond over and over again in, in my mind. Uh, of course, I grew up in the middle of corn country, so at some point I felt obliged to row out a crop, and okra was fun and easy. Aaron and Noel Weston, uh, the late Noel Weston, looking at the okra crop midsummer a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, to, to just ponder. Over the years, my vision and longing for the pond grew alongside my gardening experience. Before the pond, there were pumpkins. Before aquaculture, there was okra. And before koi, there were cover crops. Like, that's actually hairy vetch. I found out it looked really good if you uh, mow it a couple times through the winter. I really enjoyed growing that plant. And then you just till it in in the spring. So finally, in 2018, it was finally time to summon the harbingers of horticultural change. <laughs> Flags and paint. There's no going back now. So over the next year, over the year 2018, um, dug a hole, uh, roughly dug the hole with the skid steer. Um, gazebo construction began. We moved the bed edges back as far as was needed to basically set the, uh, uh, make sure that the pond was in scale with everything around it, because it was going to be a big pond. What's <coughs> neat about that space is that you can still actually get a skid steer in there, mm -hmm. should you want to. So if anything needs to change or rebuild, um, Mr. Schmidt had measured everything out so that any big or heavy machinery can still move in and out and make any sort of big horticultural change much easier. And not just the skid steer, I actually measured the wheelbase of the, um, the delivery vehicle that comes off the back of a flatbed and delivers pallets of stone. That actually has a nine and a half foot wheelbase. So whatever I build, I have to be able to get pallets of stone close. So. No matter what, I made sure that that path existed. Uh, so after the uh, hole was dug, uh, well, nature provided us a sneak peek of what the finished model would look like. And uh, that was going to be a problem unless we came up with a solution. We didn't want that to happen once we had a liner in and no way to get rid of, of the water. Uh, so we decided on a gravel burrito, more or less. Um, Basically, it's, it's very coarse but round gravel wrapped in uh, the rubber liner, actually an extension of the rubber liner coming out of the pond. Also, through that uh, gravel burrito, I ran the two-inch flexible recirculating water line. So it serves two purposes. Of course, I unburied it there. It's, it's invisible. You walk over it. Um, but the line's going through there to move the water up and back to the high ground to drop back in. And within 24 hours, um, the water drains out and it's back to exactly cool. So it's worked out really well so far. Another feature that we wanted to include in the pond was a Shinto stone. A Shinto stone is commonly found in Japan. Uh, they're often wrapped in um, a very braided rope and they get papers put across them. If you take two of them and put them together with that rope, um, they actually become married stones. They actually just mark areas where they think that spirits or life is actually living and makes a place sacred. So I like those. <laughs> so we pick one out. Yeah, that one's just over 4,000 pounds. Uh, but remember I was saying it was very important that we, we had to be able to get machinery back in there. We had to make sure no matter what we built that the machines will fit to deliver what we need. So. With a stone over 4,000 pounds, that means that a normal uh, skid steer, mo many of you probably know what they look like. They're a small but very strong tractor-like machine with a bucket on the front. It is not strong enough to lift that 4,000 pound stone. And so I actually had a few 
small pumpkins growing in that area despite the hole in the ground that year and had the, the delivery driver smash those pumpkins with the machine, much like you saw my truck do earlier in the presentation. But uh, when we were at the stone yard, knowing that it was that machine that was going to have to put the stone in place, we memorized what's, what side was it would have to face. And so when the delivery guy came, we had that all ready. The space was measured. Uh, we knew the size of the pallet that it was on. And we made sure that it was set down in exactly, exactly the orientation it needed to be. Of course, then we dug around it and kept digging around it. Um, and then we actually burned it out. So we burned the pallet out from under it. And it just dropped right into its hole. It worked out pretty good. I think it was more fun if you were there. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, here we are. Again, we're getting most of the way through 2018. The fine tuning, early 19 actually, early 2019 now. Uh, the uh, the hole has been uh, fine, finely dug now. We got the, the fine edges. Um, everything's excavated. It actually took longer to dig out the last 10% than the first 90 because the last 10% was by hand. And if you look at that hole, you can see that we've actually started to have a discussion. Although the discussion wasn't complete at this point, as I was going to find out later. You can see that we actually have layers in that back layer. So there's actually a layer that's coming up like this, a second layer coming down, and then even a deeper hole. What you're not seeing on, the, on the, this near side is that there are very shallow areas and areas where I've already started to plan building rock walls and hidey holes for other things to live in. So we've changed the shape of the pond from what it originally was and what most people think of as just a bathtub in the ground. The, uh, the Bristol Briar was ready for the pond. It's an eight, seven, eight-year-old garden at this point. A lot, a lot of things have changed and grown and it was, um, it was built up around it and ready to go. So liner delivered. You see here, here are the uh, depth contours, a little bit better look at them. Uh, to the, to the uh, left there is a large flat area that at least I had envisioned putting aquatic plants like a big bathtub full of lotus or something. Right now we have a, a nymphae, we've got a, a, a water lily, really pretty one, blooms constantly. Um, and then that deep spot over there actually favors that green giant hedge put it off center so that it is protected just a little bit more from south facing sun and therefore the deep water can also stay cooler and um, is up against a wall that is a few feet under the ground and therefore the water down deep stays pretty cool and of course the pumps down there are always circulating pulling from the cold and dumping it out you know, where, it's, where it's hotter again. so I thought that that would work and so far it has the other part before we get into the pond itself is what I call big picture berms. Over the years of looking at uh, other public and private gardens, one thing that sticks out in my mind, and it seems to be pretty common, is that for whatever reason, ponds are too high. They're not really nestled into the ground kind of uh, the above ground pool equivalent of a pond. Um, oftentimes you see that pile of rocks on one end and water's gushing out of it so it looks like Moses hit it with a stick. I guess that's biblical <laughs> kendo. <laughs> and uh, so I, that, that's something that for years I've wanted to avoid and I, part of that was building big berms around it. Uh, the more the better. Uh, the excavation of the pond provided part of one of the berms, basically. So we needed a whole lot more uh, soil and compost to complete it. Uh, the berms all around, great opportunity for 20 more pallets of stone uh, and, and uh, lots of planting space. Little nooks and crannies to tuck all kinds of really cool plants, rocks facing all directions for all kinds of exposure requirements. Cold sun, hot sun, shade, everything in between. 
So yeah, we uh, moved in an additional 31 Ford Ranger loads of soil. And here is, uh, Megan is actually, she's checking to make sure that the automatic uh, dump feature on the Ranger is working properly. Doesn't <laughs> <laughs> appear, appear to be working. You unfurled it? I think it's really big. It's over 900 pounds of rubber. If you notice the uh, black stuff there, that is the underlayment. We ran into a little bit of sharp gravel when we were digging it, so there was no way we were going to take a chance of having something happen that we don't want to mention here mm -hmm. to a big pond and lose all the water and have to find it. So we use the underlayment water. liberally and uh, it holds all the water. How did you move the liner? By hand. When it, was, when it was all rolled up, how many people was that? 900 pounds is two more people. than the two y'all can pick up. We can't no, pick we it up, but we can We can, we can <laughs> again, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Ford Ranger was able to back right up to it. Uh -huh. <laughs> when we loaded it, we knew how it needed to come out of the truck. And um, I was able to wiggle it to where it was teetering on the tailgate, which is about all that the cables on the tailgate can handle. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, I just braced myself and had Megan drive off with it. And it fell right where we wanted it. And that video on YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> Again, it was more fun if you if you were there. Um, and yeah, we just rolled the 900 pound liner right over some daffodils and down in there. And by the time it was in the bottom and towards the other end, we were able to roll it up and out. And the important thing about that liner is that it's an EPDM. Okay, that's the kind of liner that you're gonna buy if you're really serious about putting life in your pond. Um, this is a kind of liner that's really thick, and so it really helps against getting little nicks and scratches and holes, but it also doesn't leach any chemicals into your pond. Some of the liners that are a little more affordable can be this thick, it's 45. Yeah, 45. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they can be this thick, but unless you have that specialized liner, pay that little bit more, you might actually have leaching into the pond and you come out one day and everything would be belly up on mm -hmm. no fault of your own. Mm -hmm. So Megan and I had a lot of fun unraveling this. We knew then it was only a matter of time. Every drop of rain that fell, or any time the garden hose went in there, <clears throat> that thing was going to fill up permanently. Life doesn't get any better than this, right? <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. Life doesn't get any better when Jeremy's sitting in a pond liner with a exacto knife. Yeah, we're right right next utility to knife right here. <laughs> so, uh, probably not uh, sanctioned behavior, but <laughs> it's a big liner. Uh, but yeah, there it is, uh, it's starting to fill up. We've got the rocks most of the way around it. Uh, mostly filled from welcome to heavy rain. So what we did, we also, uh, part of what we did, I'm going to advance a couple here. When I put the rocks in, I put them in that last ledge right here that you can see. See that little agave to the left. Then you've got an orange flag and then another orange flag. That actually is all liner with compost and, and, and boulders. So in that spot, to the right of the screen there, you see that same, just the tip of that same agave and how far back that liner comes. It goes straight down there and then you see water accumulating. And so I have about uh, 14 inches of uh, compost there. And actually that's pretty much the equivalent of the water table too. So it's a 14 inch deep compost that always gets water from below, which allows me to grow any kind of wet plant that, you know, right now I've got the Sclepius purpurescens and some astrids and xanadeshias and cattails, but also um, eupatoria, uh, eupatoria, right? jopai weed, right next to the agaves because that's where the liner ends. Uh, so far so good. It's, we've only had it full of water for six or seven months now. So we've got a lot more planting to go. But anyway, it was great. Put the rocks in, backfilled all that compost in there, one to three feet all the way around the pond. And that's when I lost my mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, it leans back all the way through here. And if you can imagine, the liner actually comes all the way back. All the way back to the stone, Right yeah. to the Shinto stone there. So that is all compost that is leaching 
into the water of the pond. And I realized that what I was thinking about when I was thinking about the pond is not what Jeremy was thinking about when he was thinking about the pond. So when I was thinking about the pond, I was thinking about my experiences and what I was going for, and that was what was in the water. And Jeremy is primarily a horticulturalist, so he was thinking about how he could use the water to grow things in the soil. So this was my moment of coming to. This is the first test I took, and I'll show you the test equipment here, right after the pond got filled and it had been sitting for about three days. It is a pond range test. It's pretty basic. You're testing for pH, ammonia, nitrate, and phosphate. Nitrate tends to come from decaying plant material. Phosphate tends to come from fish um, waste and or from dead things. So if you have dead frog stuck in your filter, that's going to jump. The only thing that's natural here is that pH. That pH you want between 7.5, 7.0, somewhere in there. That's a good reading. The rest of these are through the roof. It's basically toxic soup, what I'm starting with. So when everything was leaching into there, if you look at my ammonia, I can't even read it. It's so far off. The ammonia should be zero. That vial should be yellow, just like ammonia. If you're looking at the nitrate, that should be blue, because it should have zero. And it is pretty much in the five range. And if you look at the phosphate, that's pretty high up there too. If you, it's a little off color from the soil, but it was reading about 1.5. So that was really high. That compost was filled with lots of organic material. So that made for a great pond all the way around for planting, but it was spelled doom for me with the water. So we'll come back to these in a minute. I started to get, up to, get to work. The first thing I did was get a bunch of equipment. Now, I don't really stand by API, because I know I have all of those up there. It's not really a branding. Um, I just happened to get a slight discount because I worked with the pond company before. Um, but yeah, I went and got everything I needed. First, three, the pond salt, Melifix, Pemafix, those are for fish if they get sick. Um, the Ponzyme and the Ecofix, those are actual beneficial bacteria, which we'll talk about. There's the Master Pond Test Kit, the Algae Fix, I knew I was going to need, even though I don't really like using chemicals because it inhibits some of the other life that I wanted in the pond. And then my barley straw. And still, working away, <laughs> a month and a half later, I am way off the charts. So just took my time and started really thinking about where to put these beneficial bacteria. And then I started talking about what I wanted out of the pond. And that came from a lot of my experiences in East Asia. So this is from Suzhou, China, where I was at Suzhou University. And this is the master of the Nets Garden, where I was one of the caretakers for the koi. I know you can't see them very well, but if you look, note the color on them. That'll come very important, because there's kind of a difference between what happens in koi in China and what happens in Japan. Um, in China, it's an actually very gorgeous place. And in this place, I learned one of the very first folk tales I learned about a koi. And that on the Yellow River, there was a literati um, who really wanted to either have a, the translations are difficult, Chinese is not my fortitude at all. So it was either a dam or it was a waterfall, depending on which translation you're working from. And he put it on this big river where carp swam up all the time. And the carp all swam up in the thousands and they came across this and almost all of them turned back and headed right back where they came. They said, we give up. But most of the time it's about 360 stayed and battled and tried to get up that waterfall, get up that dam, and they fought and they swam and they fought and they swam. And the gods that loved the literati, the Wen Chong, saw this and said, well, if they can get up there, we're going to give them a reward. And eventually, a hundred late hundred years later, they did. Once they did, they blessed them and turned them into the first dragons, the first golden dragons to actually live in the rivers and to live in the skies. Um, Masters of the Nets, they also let me do some bonsai. It's a pretty picture. And that story is really important because you don't think that a lot of this stuff actually gets transmitted across cultures. But if you play this game, you know the Maggie carp. That's basically a carp. And guess how many times you have to take him out and then put him away right away because he dies instantly in the battle. About a hundred. And if you get to a hundred, you get a dragon. <laughs> Um, in Tokyo, I worked in the Imperial Palace. Actually, the Emperor still lives in that white building. Um, and then he has an extensive garden called the Emperor's Garden. You can see it here in this blurry picture. 
Uh, occasionally they come out for photo ops in Japan's time. That's Akihito uh, feeding his koi. Now look very carefully at these koi because we're going to be talking carefully about them shortly. And here's one of mine. Um, and again, you can look at those koi and we're going to be able to name them. Typically at this point in a presentation here, I heard it, somebody puts up a really gorgeous plant picture. It's a trillion. And everyone in the audience goes, oh, oh, I want that. Well, I'm really here today to help you geek out about koi. <laughs> Nishiki goi. So Nishiki goi is the actual term for people that actually love koi. Now, these pictures are not on my own. They are specialized breeder pictures. Um, the fish that we're looking at can range up to $50,000. Um, so these are true emperor koi. They are put on blue backgrounds and blue tubs intentionally um, so that you can get a clear picture of what their actual scale and patterning looks like. And there's no way you can actually put, well, there is. But it's di more difficult to put a filter on them to make them more pretty. So where did koi come from? Well, right around the um, Tokugawa era, or the Edo era, that's after the big civil war, people had been keeping these guys in tubs, but they'd just been keeping carp, basically. They got carp from a river, and they said, hey, this is a really great source of protein and food, and it's really great to go out and have to get to eat them anytime we want, but it gets winter time, there's ice, and it gets more difficult to get these fish. So they built big wooden tubs, very similar to what they used for the baths, and started keeping the fish in there. As the tubs got bigger, the fish lived longer, which meant they got the tasty protein snack longer into the winter. And since there was a region of peace, this uh, practice continued until the tubs got so big, the fish stayed alive and started to put offspring, started to breed. And when they started to breed, people began to notice that they do strange things. Like they get off colors, they turn white, they turn albino. And in the Nara and Kyoto region, people started to have competitions. Look at how cool my fish is. And that was the start of the basic emperor's koi. This is the 13, or one of those 13 standards. These are the ones that I like the most. Um, there are very clear definitions. If somebody tells you that you have a one-third, you know, um, tancho with a something, no, 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 no. <laughs> you can have those, and they are koi. But these certain characteristics are noted for personality. This may or may not be true, but this is what I was told in the garden. They're noted for longevity. There was a whispered rumor that fish that are in the emperor's garden can live to 200 years. I've never seen it. Um, at the most I've seen is about 50 to 60. They are long-lived. They are like parrots. Um, and for intelligence. So they're, they're really smart. They're water puppies. And that's what I've been talking to Jeremy about the whole time, is that they're water puppies. And I've never explained all of this and why this pond and the water meant so much to me. If you're going to get a koi, I do highly re recommend getting a pedigree. This seems really silly. Um, but there are a lot of diseases that come with koi that you can never actually get out of the water, and some of them are absolutely incurable. So you want to get a reputable breeder, and you want to get a fish from a reputable source just to protect your other fish and your future of your pond, because you really don't want to drain everything and start all over again. Welcome to the very first koi ever. Uh, this is a Kohaku koi. In the ponds that they were going into, these gardens were for literati and educated people. You were meant to go outside at night, and you were meant to go outside during the day, write poetry, read, sit and enjoy the environment that was nature because humans had tamed it. And this koi represents that ex exactly. The orange spots are supposed to look like the stones that go around the rocks on the, po on the pond, and they're supposed to be close enough together so that a woman in a kimono can step from one to the other and still walk properly. Most Westerners walk improperly in a kimono by walking too broad. You should never, ever have that bottom seam open if you're going to walk properly in a kimono. So if you're going to be a sexy geisha for Halloween, please don't. It, just, it doesn't work. The next one was the tancho. This one was very, very uh, popular. It kind of looks like almost the Japanese black. It's the nationalist koi. Um, it's one of the second ones that came out. And just look at that fish. Oh, God. Um, I really like the Tancho Saki, again, so you've got all of those different patternings. You've got the standard fins here, which are nice and round. Um, most female kois uh, lose, their, uh, lose their color, they become duller. Male kois tend to stay brighter, that's just a, a biological feature of them. Um, as they continue to brin, the ginrin 
is actually, it means um, shiny silver scale. So the Gin Rin is the Rins are actually the scales, the Gin represents silver. So we're starting to see a new trend here that we're developing in the early koi where they actually get a little bit of sparkle along their fins, so that are along their scales, especially along their back. That was important, especially if you were going to be looking at things in moonlight. The Showa is one of the most stunning koi. They're the hardest to get because they actually have a white and black base on their body. If you pick up their scales, you can actually see the skin color underneath them. So instead of being ones that are all black with just different colored scales, they are actually a mixed koi that gives a really great breeding opportunities. The Susi is one of my favorites. It's what was typically called the skeleton koi here in the United States. That's the first time you start seeing that really distinctive black pattern running down the back of the koi um, in order for them to hide from predators or for them to be shown better in sunlight. And the ki susi, so what you're going to see is each color actually does have meaning. Ki is going to be the golden color. Anytime you see ki, you can think money. Uh, it's basically gold. And what it's symbolizing for people in the garden when you come to visit is that this individual um, was hoping that they are very fiscally sound, that their um, industry is going to continue onward, and that they will continue gathering riches. So by going to these gardens and knowing what these koi are and what the colors and other things symbolize, what time period, or whether they're nationalist, or whether they're the kimono koi that you have to step across rocks on, you get a pretty good feel of the family that lives there because they're not just selecting them willy-nilly. So the Tachi Goshiki, uh, the Goshiki is one of the first ones that starts really getting that really great patterning <coughs> all the way up the back um, with the shiny gray scales. It was meant to be viewed in moonlight so that poetry reading, you could see them when the moon was on it with that silvery scale. Um, they were the best ones that are in, po in um, poetry and you'll see that in some of the paintings too from the uh, paint from the period. I have never met a Beko, but I want one. <laughs> <laughs> this is a solid white based koi that has uh, black spots. Uh, and here is the Asagi. This is, this is my koi. This is the start of the Meiji period. Um, this was the koi that one of the, one of the first koi that the emperors actually took. It's supposed to represent modernity. Okay? So you've got really clean lines going through here, and you can see the earlier patterns continue to develop as people continue to breed and work with the koi. The cleaner the lines, the cleaner the colors, the more differentiated the spots, the better the koi there is. And now you've got the Tancho Asahi. So you've got the uh, nationalist fish that is now also an emperor's koi representing modernity. The Hikiri actually means um, Pika Pika. They're sort of the same thing, so again, Pokemon. Uh, but it means sparkle, sparkle. And so these guys were one of the first to actually develop fully raised bumps all along the sides of their scales, which allows them to actually catch a whole lot of light while they're swimming. Um, Kikiri around here tends to mean butterfly. For the most part, butterfly just means elongated fins. If you are lucky enough to get a butterfly, sometimes they have a genetic variant of the phalange, where their fins never stop growing, neither do their whiskers. Um, that's just luck of the draw. It's really hard to breed that or find it. Um, there was one in the Emperor's Garden that would swim by me, and for the length of the koi that passed, there was the same tail fin length that had all the ripples in the body. It was absolutely exquisite. So, I really like these fish. If you've got a black base fish with red, uh, that actually means uh, motherhood. You can probably guess why. It's femininity. It's a woman. Um, if you've got a black base fish with yellow, again, that's money. Um, it also has masculinity for the fiscal earner of the household. And while I really like <coughs> koi, every garden that I've been to really pushes to be able to incorporate lots of biological diversity. So when I was building this pond, when we started talking about it, we were looking for mm -hmm. layers for the, us to put the odonata and to put um, salamanders and other things to have rooms for them, even though I was focused on koi. As soon as the pond filled up with water, I immediately knew that we had to keep the neighbors happy. And the best way to do that is to get some fish in there immediately because of mosquitoes. <laughs> um, with um, Zachary Hill's help, we stayed late after work, we were able to get some of the native mosquito fish, the Gambusii, um, Holbrookii. And these guys are in the guppy family. They have upper facing mouths, which allow them to pick off mosquito larvae that are sipping air with the siphon. Um, so they're really great for eating mosquitoes a lot. And with the way that we actually built the pond, 
we had a huge population, a huge population in almost no time. They give live birth, they kind of balance themselves out, and the best part was, I think there was no mosquitoes in the yard around the pond. Yeah, I mean, if, if we wanted to go to one spot in the yard, we weren't going to get bit by mosquitoes, it'd be the pond. Um, between the mosquito fish, which it looked like a bait tank at that point, uh, in just a couple of months it went from 12 to 12,000 or more. It was clouds of them. <laughs> and then just dragonflies swooping across, like, just, it was incredible. It was, it was movement all the time, in the water, out of the water, except for mosquitoes, they didn't stand a chance. Yeah. So, yeah, we had an algae bloom. <laughs> with, with those kind of pond readings, it was definitely going to have an algae bloom. Now, most people don't like algae. And if you want a clean pond that's just meant for display, like the hotel ponds, please feel free to go and get some chlorine or whatever you need to dump in there. It'll keep the sides clean. You won't have any algae. It'll be sparkly. You put a light in. But that's not what we were looking for. A lot of people think all algaes are bad. This is angel hair algae. It's actually not. Um, it's actually one of the biggest filters for nitrate, nitrite, and phosphate. They just suck it all up, and you can tear them out and throw it out. People occasionally will try to sell you a UV light to get rid of this. It is a trap um, if you're interested in ponds. The UV lights can only work if they're kept in a dark box and a filter, um, and they can only work then on particulate algae. This is not a particulate algae. It clings to a rock streams itself down. So if you have this and somebody says, buy this expensive piece of equipment to get rid of it, it doesn't work. I promise. So continuing the work, we started getting the beneficial bacteria set up. The thing with beneficial bacteria, and we'll get there shortly, is that they need a place to live. So we ended up not only building filtration to incorporate this, but I ended up buying a number of bio boxes, and they're black planting boxes that have a number of little tiny holes and you can put a porous material in there that provides lots and lots of surface area. And then you choose the beneficial bacteria that you want for the pond and your algae and actually stir it in. With the placement of a plant in the middle, it draws the water in and through those rocks, allowing the algae to clean some of the nitrate, nitrite, and phosphate out of the water for you. And so after I explained that to Jeremy, he built me my box. <coughs> Yeah, so we could have spent, uh, how much are those things? $700. Yeah, 700 bucks pass. Uh, we went to Harbor Freight and got a big old tub. I think it was 10 bucks. Uh, got some drain things that allow us to get a nice bulkhead seal. Uh, took the two inch uh, flexible line, transferred to two inch rigid PVC. Dropped it in, one in, and then two out. It's important that there is no back pressure, because if there is, you lose all your water out of the box and drain the pond in a day. Um, to burn up your pump and kill your fish. So, you know, that, that's very important. So two outlets to one inlet, at least. Um, and then on the right, uh, we've got a couple things. I look at it mainly as just an incredible amount of surface area for uh, microbes to live and to strain the water. So at the top, those are bio balls. Yep. And uh, in the bottom, that's it's just a filter. It's a, a, a formerly white filter. <laughs> and we just, uh, Megan cut it into the right size and threw it in the box. Water hits that, goes through that, goes through the bio balls, goes out the, uh, the two holes. And I think our total cost for that, uh, for the box and pipes was $30 about. How much for the, the filter and bio balls? That was probably another 45 um, the important thing about those filters and those bio balls is that please don't treat them like dishes. All right, I know they're dirty. I'm showing you dirty stuff on purpose. Dirty. That's because they actually have a live colony of beneficial bacteria and microbes in there right now. If you try to clean your pond and you take those filters out and spray them with a the hose, what happens, Jeremy? It makes Megan angry. <laughs> <laughs> you get another algae bloom because you have to start all over colonizing your pond with the microbes again. Yeah, so don't do it. Just bang it out on a rock. A little bit of rinsing. Yeah. I got it really clean. Good <laughs> going back in the box. Uh, there's the two outlets out. And so this is hidden under another wooden structure. Part of the reason that we took this route is we just we don't have a lot of grade change other than our berms, but those are, are adjacent. 
So we didn't have a mountain that we could tumble the water down. So here, although the water is, it dumps out about a foot, about a foot above the pool, uh, it's enough to tumble and oxygenate, but it's not really enough to make it look great. It's not enough to really hide the box. So that's why we put another deck on top of it. We, put a, we built a, a bonsai training and viewing deck. So we're going to have a really cool bonsai collection. In 20 years. <laughs> In 20 years or so. Off to a good start already. Uh, but it hides this. As you can see in the last one, it just, it's a wooden trap door on the deck. You just pop it out, and go in there, and open the top. Um, here's a picture of, um, and Megan will go into detail about why it's important to move the water all the time. So we've got the waterfall tumbling down, and that's about 50 gallons a minute. Um, yeah, Megan? So when you have a pond that you're trying to keep live biological organisms in and trying to have biodiversity in, it's important that every part of the pond, even if you are going to plan for nooks and crannies, overhangs, shallow areas, that you actually figure out a way that the water is going to move. Watch where it comes out from the filter, watch where the actual pump is, where it's taking it out, and watch where those dead areas are gonna be. That whole pond, that whole water, really needs to turn over once an hour. It's pretty easy to calculate. Most general calculations are length, depth, width, times 7.5. Um, to figure out the waterfall is another little set of equations that then you can figure out how big a pump you need. When we looked at our pond, I realized that there wasn't enough movement in the back corner. So I got a pusher. And I ended up using it for a couple other tricks as well. While it's pushing water across rocks, you can also change its direction during times where the oxygen level is lowest in the water. Yeah, when she first used the term pusher, I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> it actually, it's just a, it's a Lowe's or a Home Depot pond pump. So it's the same pond pump you might put in a smaller water feature only it doesn't have a long hose attached to it. It just sucks water and dumps it right back out with speed. And so that's all it is. It's just a little 110 pump. It's about a $50, $60 pump. It's not a big one, but that's throwing, that's pushing about 20 gallons a minute with speed. And so that takes care of the dead zones. Now we've got the 50 gallons a minute tumbling over rocks in um, slowly, but with force, and then this thing is throwing that last little bit with speed. So the whole thing, uh, it actually rotates uh, counterclockwise, right? Yeah, the whole pond, even in the shallows, everywhere. So it keeps it keeps it healthy, keeps it turned up, keeps everything going through that filter every every few hours. Yeah, that's a blank slide. Cool. All right. Yeah. So when I was saying the hidden nooks, uh, hidden crannies, depths, and shallows. Um, those are intentional in order to get more wild or more life living in there. Um, in order to accommodate that, we look here, we actually have very strange structures for a pond. We do have a lot of wood, of, of driftwood, that has been incorporated into the pond. This one is hollow, so you've got a really wonderful area in there, although I haven't found anything there in there yet. One of these days, I promise I'll peek in there and find something. Um, this is the entire shallow area here. One of them. One of them. Yeah. This area, whole back here, um, is an underwater structure that has not only a lip, but Jeremy was handing me big, giant rocks, which I could handle because they're lighter they're in the water, yeah. um, where they're all stacked in between with lots of all those nooks and crannies. So that, let's say a predator does come to the pond, and I have fish in there, there's places for them to hide. Like you, It's really nice to see your fish all the time. I like that. Um, but if you want to keep your fish alive, especially if you bought a $100 fish, it's nice for them to have a place to, to hide. Yeah. Also, the um, again, since things aren't really grown up yet, uh, not a lot of plants around it yet, or not old ones anyway, mature ones, we opted to string a little extra shade over there. Plus, we let the water high so it get a little crazy. Mm -hmm. Intentionally, we just scoop it out with a fishing net. No problem. But that provided shade. It continued to suck the nitrogen out of the pond. Um, it benefited from the compost, too. <laughs> yeah. um, we also built, and there's a picture coming up that shows it, we built a four foot by eight foot structure with some flexible fencing on it uh, that we put straddling over the top of the deepest layer in the pond. It's sunk, you can't see it from here. 
but the fish hide under there about 20 hours out of the day. Um, they like it, and we have herons that visit occasionally. Um, so in, for now, we, we keep that uh, keep that in there. But uh, yeah, yeah. So you can see right there. There's Megan doing a more recent batch of tests, which showed that the nitrogen level was fine. It was acceptable. The pH was off. Yeah, pH has gotten really high, which we can fix that with vinegar. But there, right, right there, you can see the sun hitting it at the right angle is that uh, platform that fish hide under. And it gives them complete protection from uh, the heron that likes to visit on occasion. We think the heron, we bought, uh, Megan bought 12 goldfish. We still have seven. <laughs> and so they're about 25 cents a piece, which is cheaper than the bait I used to catch crop. I'm a little jealous. <laughs> But yeah, we still got seven of them. We got uh, mosquito fish, and we have all four core. Hot, jumped the gun. Jumped the gun. What? So we started fixing everything. Um, once we got a little more established, once I was able to even things out, um, you used the Ponzyme and the EcoFix. Both of those have different, um, but beneficial bacteria. The phosphate in a pond tends to produce um, a brown algae or brown film, nitrate, nitrite, uh, tends to produce a brown, a big green bloom. Uh, both of those can help be eliminated by the barley straw, which actually releases um, uh, water-soluble carbohydrates. What that does, it binds is any particulate matter that's in the pond, it binds it together so it sinks to the bottom, you can suck it up with your filter. And in your filter is your bio colony of all your little microbes and friends, and they eat it all up. So we were really close at this point, close enough that I got coy. You, you got we, we got. Yeah, we got. <laughs> <laughs> we got coy. Um, we got them from uh, East Coast Koi Imports, who also has pedigrees up on the wall. Uh, he got most of them from Japan. Uh, they are not the most expensive koi. They are not the five fifty thousand dollar koi. Okay. Uh, but you can see the characteristics. You definitely have the Kohaku koi, one of the first ones, the Kincho Rocho, the yellow bar koi right there, which is a hikari, a butterfly. Um, one that's almost like a skeleton, but skeleton is a little more pricey. So we call him Skeletor. Um, and then we have Regal, which is um, the Tancho Shiro koi. Hoi. So that's that one right there, the big one in the middle. Hmm? Yeah, Regal and Shiloh's the, the yellow one, although she looks white in the water. She does. And, and of course, the the, uh, the big cow there the, in the back, that one we've, we've named Croy. So we couldn't figure out a name for it. And then one day I saw it pick off a mosquito fish, much like a crappie would. So it was a Koi crappie hybrid. <laughs> so it was Croy. Um, when you're putting fish in a pond, as many of you know, you want to leave that bag in the, half an hour, in the water for about a half an hour so the temperature evens out. Open it up afterwards. Oh, keep a cloth on it so the sun doesn't get in there. Open it up afterwards, put 50% of your own water in there, close it up, and leave it for another 20. You're giving the fish a chance to get adjusted to the pH or the phosphate nitrate differences between their old pond and the new. And after they've been all adjusted, off they go. That way it's not too shocky for them. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a, uh, uh, it's a crappie I caught a few years ago. Uh, but yeah, I wanted, I wanted some of those in the pond. That's a 3.1 something pound crappie. I let it go, it swims freely just like the crappie in the uh, in our pond does now. Uh, this fall we let uh, two crappies go and we're, where we had a bait tank full of mosquito fish, now we have a bait tank full of a couple of mosquito fish here and there. <coughs> so, although I've never seen them since I've released them because they don't want to show themselves like, like koi do, uh, they're still there. And actually, the cool thing about Way that Megan can test the waters. If one had died and just sunk to the bottom under the under the protection we have, the test would actually show that. Hmm. We would see that there was a lot of phosphate. Yeah, so the phosphate would skyrocket from a dead fish like that. Um, so there's a picture of uh, Megan poking around in one of the shallow areas. Again, if the water is only, it's never more than about two inches deep there in between that uh, four to six inch gravel. Uh, so Megan was pecking around and, and she saw one of the white spotted slimy, slimy white spotted salamanders. Slimy white spotted salamanders. That's the same yep. Slime. yep, so she's poking around there. I couldn't quite get the camera over in time. It wiggled away, but we've got really excited about mm -hmm. that. We have salamanders. We see the 
little piles of poop sometimes too, so you know they're alive and well. Did y'all put those in? Nope. No, they found their way in. There's, they're, they're around here. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so we, we had a neat uh, little uh, garden party this summer. And uh, there's a couple pictures of it just for, just for what it is. Yeah, so um, if you have any questions about pond salting, which I forgot to mention, or anything else, let us know. Um, this pond is still early in development. It definitely is going to take a couple more years before it levels itself out, and I don't have to add any more uh, colonies or beneficial bacteria. But we are <coughs> truly excited. And guess what? I've got my fish, and he's got his plants. <laughs> Probably too. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you all very much. Thank you. A little time for a few questions, if there are any. Yes, Amelia. So, right at the very beginning, you were talking about this big round thing with gravel for drainage, or yeah, the gravel burrito. So, where is that? That is right up against the. Um, that uh, pentagonal shaped right here. gazebo. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's like right behind the alocasia there. Oh, okay. Yep, and it goes straight back through the green giant arborvitae hedge. Oh, okay. And so it, uh, the liner comes up and then actually extends way out, but shallower, right at the pool level. And then we put uh, that three to six inch uh, round, and I emphasize that often, round gravel in that burrito and also strung through our two inch recirculating line, so it also acts to hide that. Um, and it, it's worked great. I mean, again, within 24 hours, the pond's back down. And personally, I kind of like it when the water comes up for a few hours. Yeah. It just, it, it allows, them, I think, the mosquito fish can get up into the, a little bit shallower water. I, I don't know, it's usually a good thing in a lake, so probably a good thing in a pond, too. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yes. Do you have any trouble with the drought this summer, keeping it full? Not much. We put the hose in a couple. I'm up in northern Wake County, but I didn't get any rain for nine weeks. It was similar. Um, we actually didn't fill the pond until late June. Correct, yeah. Um, and, yeah, we had a couple big rains that took care of about 75% of that, and then the garden hose couple times finished it off but there was no rush to get it full and then once it was uh, full Megan tested the water <laughs> and there was no rush to put koi um, in so yeah and when you fill a pond um, I particularly like to have it have a 0.1 or 0.15 ratio of salt in there um, most koi have one percent of salt in their bodies if you put that salt in the water not too much and if you put too much in, you have to drain water out and you have to start all over again. But what it does is it actually helps prevent the osmosis of the salt in the fish going into the water, which seems silly, but it actually creates a much stronger uh, stress coat or their, their nice biological um, slime coat, which helps prevent microorganisms or bacteria or other diseases from attacking very delicate parts like their fins. Um, most places that do heavy koi breeding actually have a lot of salt in their water. Um, if your koi actually got sick, you could raise that uh, percentage up to 0.3, which is dangerous, but that's enough to actually wipe out most of viruses and most of the bacteria that would actually infect, infect their fins. Then drain the pond, <laughs> put some more slime in, start all over, because you want to get some of that salt out of there. But it's, that's parts per thousand, right? It's part per thousand, correct, PPT. Yeah, no, I, I know that there's a lot of that. that up on. Yeah. <laughs> you know it. I'm like, yep, it's all. <laughs> um, I think we, we had to fill the thing. We had to add about once a week when it was really hot because of the, you know, we had water moving. We also had that pusher that, that uh, I had a picture of. We actually turned it up in the summer so that it shot out of the water. And so even though it was still pushing water, it was also splattering water and adding an ad additional yeah. amount of oxygen. You can see it right oh, there. Oh, yeah, there it is, right there, yeah. So it's a little unsightly. Again, this is a brand new pond. Mm -hmm. um, but once the pond was lacking our oxygen and there was still high nitrate and we still had a lot of heat in there, um, turning it up 
actually increased the rippling effect on the surface of the water, which helps release CO2, which algae really likes, and helps increase oxygen levels, which the fish really like. So it's a neat little trick. Um, again, not most aesthetically pleasing, but for a big a pond just becoming established, it works really well. It was nice to watch the south-facing uh, Selaginella get uh, misted every day from the from the, the splatter zone too. I really enjoyed that. So. Yeah, plant stuff. <laughs> uh, any more? Yes. Do you have any turtles either visiting or living in the pond? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> um, no, they can move in, I suppose, but they're awful voracious eaters. Um, and even if they can't finish off the whole fish, if you have one that's about pancake size, they'll still take a bite out of a koi fin. So I, I'm kind of on that lookout for them. <laughs> and if they move in, I will love them and honor them and move them to another pond. <laughs> Any more questions? There's one over here, I believe. Uh, yes. Do you also have an issue with the coons? Uh, we haven't uh, seen any. We do have coons problems. in the neighborhood. Yeah. I haven't seen any problems in the by the pond. Partially that's because um, we have an owl, a fake owl, which has a little mm -hmm. solar panel on its head, yeah. and we move it around a lot, um, and that tends to keep the raccoons away from there. So mm. I also have a cat that's vicious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Has Jeremy's plants been attacked by your koi yet? Because my koi seemed to destroy any plant that goes in the pond. I gave them enough water hyacinth that they were quite happy with their salad. And occasionally they do pick off the mosquito fish. So mm -hmm. there, there's enough going on in there. If you, if you don't, I don't feed the koi. It's dangerous to feed koi, A, because it puts phosphate into the water um, if they don't eat all of the food. Mm -hmm. If you get in the habit of feeding them and the water gets cold, they actually don't have enough blood in their bodies with their heart going into a very slow state, very much like hibernation, to digest what's in their digestive system. So what can happen is that food just gets fatter and full with water and it can actually cause internal damage and can harm the fish greatly. So I choose to let my fish... They, they blow up. No. <laughs> I choose to let my fish eat what they can find. Yes? How do they survive the winter? They sleep. They hibernate just like bear. Yeah, they don't come out much actually anymore. Uh, they just when it just gets dark, uh, usually Croy will stick its head out, Shiloh will mm -hmm. stick uh, her head out just for a couple minutes. The goldfish kind of hang out, they don't really know any better. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they go back in, and that's it. In the summer, they'll go and they'll swim all over. When it's light out, they're out. But yeah, in the winter, they, you'll see them just stick their head out enough to pick it a little bit of angel hair. And then they go back in. They're very reclusive. They don't move fast. But the cold water in itself is not harmful to them. Mm -hmm. They could freeze over solid. I mean, freeze over a few inches thick. As long as they have water to swim in, they'll be fine. Yes? What did you say the dimensions of the pond were? Rock? Is it? It's about a 30 by 20 with all the stone and everything in it. Maybe 30 by. 17. Mm -hmm. with, with the stone, yeah. Yeah. It's big. Yes. Um, have you seen any great blue herons? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and you, I'm having trouble picturing what it is that you put in the deep end that keeps the herons, that gives them a hiding place. Can you, do you have any pictures or anything? The best one that we have, because it's gotten sunk already, yeah. is yeah. this one here. And if you look closely, there's a nice, um, PVC structure, and we have a piece of netting, sort of like deer fence, over it that we zip tied down. So it's this square right here, and then on the middle part, middle part of it is actually completely covered, so no sun can get in there. Yeah, we took a, took a piece of liner and put it on the middle, so there's an opaque section as well. But basically, it's a four by eight thing, <laughs> four by eight panel that is mostly like a deer fence with a PVC frame that straddles the deepest part of the pond so that fish swim on it. They have plenty of room to swim out either end. But that means that, the, that you know, when the herons come around, we, we haven't trained the koi yet. We don't want them to be that friendly yet. We'd rather them kind of swim away when, when any movement that they don't recognize gets close. Um, and yeah, they go right under and nothing's going to get them there. So it's a PVC frame mm -hmm. yeah, what, what, with, uh, with a netting You can on. use anything you want as long as it's not going to put a hole in the liner. So be creative. Well, and, and what about like a B 
be careful with treated wood though too. You wouldn't want to build a treated wood frame in the water probably. Um, the, the way that I was able to sink it, because if you glue PVC together, you're going to trap a lot of air. So what I did is I took um, electrical metal conduit, which is which is I used three quarter PVC and one one half uh, one half electrical conduit, which fit perfectly into PVC which gave it enough weight, even with the air trapped, um, to sink. It, it's barely sank, so, and it stays down, no problem. So, and then I glued it all together and trapped it in there. And then is there, did you say there's pond liner on top of part just of that? Just an extra spare piece, yeah. and that was just to keep it darker when the pond doesn't have a lot of foliage yet. Um, but it doesn't cover the whole four by eight feet, it covers no. a portion of it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, koi, we don't train the koi because they are very friendly. They are water puppies. Um, and the first thing they learn isn't sight because anything approaching the top of the surface of the pond by sight automatically trigger, triggers a reaction of, you might eat me, you are a bird, you are a predator. But they're smart enough to figure out human voices very quickly. So if you talk to your fish enough, and actually go out there and be like, hi guys, and, mm -hmm. and they'll all come up and be like, ah, <laughs> feed me. It uh, tops out at just a here. little over. Yes, yeah, so she, she gets she gets in more. I get it. It's about here. Right there. That's, <laughs> that's, a, a, deep, that's a deep part right there. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, that looks like the questions. Oh, one more. One more. Yeah, how much is your electrical going up? <laughs> it has gone up uh, about seventy dollars a month. Thank you so much, Jeremy and Megan.